Calvin Klein represented American style. Easy to wear clothes, lots of t-shirts, lots of simple fabrics, things for, for women to really live in. What he did was always move and feel with the times, but in that sense, really keeping to his American roots. It wasn't about ostentatiousness. It was really very much the simple, clean, modernist look. Confident design and incredibly savvy marketing. If you're saying who is Calvin Klein, it's a man that became a label, it's, and it, the label ultimately became more known than the man. People know the name, but they don't know the man. Calvin Klein was born in 1942 in an area of the Bronx. It was a middle-class area um, with a high number of Jewish immigrants. Calvin Klein's father himself was an immigrant from Hungary. It's quite remarkable because not only was Calvin Klein born and raised in that area, but Ralph Lauren was concurrently. He had an interesting relationship with his father who was often absent, but uh, he ran a greengrocer's and this was something that the young Calvin was very interested in, uh, specifically the price of things, which is interesting knowing what he went on to do. Calvin Klein was very close to his mother, who was called Flo, um, and also his grandmother, who had an alteration shop. And really, for, for Calvin Klein growing up in, in the Bronx, that was his first kind of introduction to, to fashion. His mother was very artistically inclined. She favored Calvin um, as, as a child, and she encouraged his kind of his artistic side. She encouraged his interest in fashion, his interest in art and in design. During this time, he worked in the evenings as a stock boy at Department Store Alexander. Calvin Klein was interested in, in clothes and fashion early on. He studied at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, although he never graduated. Instead, he went to work for a series of garment manufacturers. The, the most notable one was a manufacturer called Dan Milstein, um, who Klein worked for as a junior designer. Um, he made the comment once that he saw a woman walking down the street wearing one of the garments he designed for Milstein, which um, consisted mostly of brightly coloured wool suits. He saw a woman wearing one that was head to toe yellow, and he went back and quit his job immediately. Whilst he was studying at FIT, he met his first wife, Jane Center, and they were married in 1964. Um, they were married for 10 years and have one daughter. After 10 years working as an apprentice and training in clothing, Calvin Klein launched his first company in 1968 in partnership with friend and businessman Barry K. Schwartz. Barry K. Schwartz was Calvin Klein's um, best friend from the uh, earliest time in his life. They'd both grown up alongside each other. Calvin had, had always talked to Barry about wanting to, to be a fashion designer, wanting to set up a fashion business. When the time came that he left Dan Milstein and wanted to set up on his own, it was actually Barry Schwartz who fronted the money. He loaned Calvin Klein $10,000, and they became partners in this new venture to, to launch his label. Schwartz was known, or it was said about him, that he could add up numbers quicker than a calculator. And he was a very shrewd businessman, really kind of hammering down prices and cutting some really amazing deals at the beginning of their uh, company. When Calvin Klein launched his company, he did launch it um, around coats and dresses. Um, and they were originally stocked in the Young Miss department. They were seen as very youthful, um, very fresh, kind of very simple, straightforward. Um, there was a certain echo of the European designs of Yves Saint Laurent when he, he first began. He became to be referred to as America's answer to Yves Saint Laurent because they both focused on this idea of kind of a new woman, of a, of a, a strong, independent woman who wanted to be dressed quite simply but very crisply and incredibly chicly. There was a great deal of sophistication to what he was doing. He opened in the York Hotel in New York and it was a really very uh, dingy basement. And during this time, he had a visit from a buyer from Bonwit Teller. One day, a, a buyer for Bonwit Teller got off on the wrong floor 
and noticed Calvin Klein's clothes and um, immediately asked to see more of them. He wanted Calvin to come and show the clothes to Mildred Custin, who was the president of Bonwit Teller, uh, because he thought that she would be interested in the clothes and may want to buy them. Um, so Calvin Klein wheeled the rack of clothes himself uptown. He didn't want to put it in a taxi because he didn't want to fold the clothes. He didn't want anything to crease the clothes and he didn't trust anybody else to take them. So he himself wheeled it uptown to Bonwit Teller to show it to the president. Um, she loved the clothes, she thought they were perfect, and she placed uh, an order amounting to $50,000 and decided to place them in eight of the store's windows um, to really launch Calvin Klein, and that's exactly what it did. Baron Nicholas de Gunsberg was um, a European socialite who'd moved across to New York post-war. He had a position at American Vogue and was really basically incredibly high placed in New York fashion and in New York high society. Um, and he kind of took Calvin Klein under his wing, first of all to introduce him to different society figures, but also to kind of impart his ideas of elegance and of style onto the young designer. Under Baron de Gunsberg's tutelage, Calvin Klein continued to develop his designs and gain further exposure. Calvin Klein really noticed a change and a shift. In the late 60s, New York or American fashion was, was really um, dictated to by the hippie movement, the swinging 60s. So there was very much remnants of the miniskirt and the psychedelic hippie uh, clothing that had been so popular during the decade. Calvin Klein noticed a shift and really inspired by the urban youth of New York and noticing a simplicity in their clothing, he really catered to that. So his garments were very much, their design aspects were on simple lines, tailoring, very, very minimal. And that really kind of chimed with the times and was very, very different. <laughs> A real turning point for Klein was being featured on the cover of September 1969, Vogue. For a young designer to get the cover of Vogue now is extraordinary. And back then for Calvin Klein to get the cover of Vogue when there were the, the Yves Saint Laurent's and the Dior's and the Chanel's to be supported was quite extraordinary, both for an endorsement of an emerging American fashion and also as an endorsement of him as a young designer. By the early 1970s, Calvin Klein had significantly widened his collection. Although Klein started off in coats and dresses, by the early 1970s he's expanded. It's a, it's a full offering of women's wear. It's across all different categories, it's a full wardrobe, it's a real fashion brand. Klein introduced blazers, sportswear and underwear to his women's wear line. This really created a way for women to access the garments on many different levels. It wasn't that he was designing specifically for evening wear. He was really providing a real range. And I think something really interesting about Klein was that he really, really very early on introduced separates, and that was really kind of one of the foundations of his brand. And this meant that things could go from day to evening, it could be paired with many, many different ensembles, and that meant there was a real accessibility for people um, and a real kind of transformative nature uh, with each object. <laughs> In the early 70s, Klein introduced his trademark jeans, and these are really something that we, 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 we really know him for. I think the interesting thing with Calvin Klein introducing his, his denim wear is really that he was, the first per, he was the first designer to put his name on jeans. He did redesign the jeans. I think that's something that people often overlook. What he did was he made the jeans tighter, he um, made them have a button crotch because he thought a button crotch was sexier. Um, he lifted the jeans so they would um, define the buttocks. He lifted the seam in between the buttocks to, to really part them. He tweaked the jeans, basically, to make them into kind of a fashion item. At this point, Calvin Klein had been going out to discotheques in the 70s. He'd been seeing men and women wearing jeans, seeing how they were kind of a new, sexy way for people to dress in the evening, um, and also how what they really did was focus attention on the body inside them. As long as you had a good body, you could look great in a pair of jeans. And that was really what Calvin Klein's jeans were all about. It was, the, the, it was him starting to market around this idea of sexiness. And they were so popular. You know, it's reported just a few years after their release that 40,000 were sold a week. It catapulted his business from a $25 million business to a $180 million business in a single year. That was the reaction that people had to those jeans. 
Well, Karen Klein won the Culty American Fashion Critics Award not once, but three times in quick succession. When he won it in 1973, he was the youngest designer ever to win it. Um, he then won it subsequently in 74 and in 75. I think really what that did was, was again, to, to further cement his place in kind of the, the fashion world. He'd really built a brand from nothing and it had had phenomenal amount of his success. Extraordinary, really. So it really shows his kind of ambition and how much he'd achieved in such a short space of time. In 1975, Vogue celebrated Klein by saying that he defined the American look if in a hundred years we were to look back at 1975 and what was all American about design, we would definitely look at Klein. I think that's a really interesting statement because I think he did really fit into the American woman's lifestyle. And what he created was something that represented what was the zeitgeist of the times. By the mid-1970s, Karen Klein's expanded his label um, into a, a full offering for women. Um, it's built around uh, an idea of kind of minimalism. It's built around a simplicity, um, a lot of earth tones, because the earth tones were his mother's favourite. And really, Calvin Klein himself said that really he used earth tones for the first 10 years of his career, because those were his mother's favourite colours. But what that also chimes with, obviously, is, is a general move in New York fashion. You see what... Um, Donna Karen was doing at Anne Klein, and you see what Holston was doing. And really, it's, it's all around these ideas of simple, understated shapes, um, very easy, um, very easy to wear, um, very straightforward, standard garments, shirt waist dresses, um, long skirts, trousers, um, suits. They're really kind of clothes from modern woman. Really, very quickly, his annual turnover was in the millions and he was selling so well because he had really created a brand. So Calvin Klein synonymous with what he was creating, everything fitting into that brand identity. And I think that's quite extraordinary for that time. Uh, there's very few other designers that have done that. In 1980, Calvin Klein employed Richard Avedon to make his advertising campaign. And in turn, it featured a 15-year-old Brooke Shields. Now, this was really, really quite controversial and was actually banned from television. You want to know what comes between me and my Calvins? Nothing. And if you think about that now, it would never be allowed. It really is this, this idea of, of sex selling being brought into the fashion arena for the first time. The way that Calvin Klein was marketing his jeans was that they were for everybody's eyes. It was about attracting attention. It was about courting controversy. And it was about kind of seducing people into buying something. And it, it really had a phenomenal effect. One of his lasting um, legacies, I think, on fashion is that introduction of, of sex into the marketing of fashion. It's something that Tom Ford played off so well at Gucci 20 years later, but it's the same formula. It's what Calvin Klein did in the 70s. That was really quite risky risky uh, statements and actually got incredible amount of traction. But really interesting historically is that that's the first time they're referred to as Calvins, which we now still use and, uh, you know, universally people understand what that, that means. In the early 80s, Calvin Klein introduced underwear, and this was really revolutionary. At the time, white briefs would be sold in packs of three, and they'd be bought by uh, a mother, girlfriend, wife, for a man, um, as and when needed. And so I think his introduction really created a shift in men actually seeking out the brand he also designed women's boxer shorts, uh, which again is revolutionary. Those were the kind of core of, of Calvin Klein's commercial success. And they're incredibly simple garments, but they're immediately identifiable. Um, you know, Calvin Klein was the first person to think to put his name on underwear, uh, to, you know, to the point where in, in Back to the Future, when someone sees Marty McFly wearing Calvin Klein underwear, they assume his name's Calvin Klein. I've never seen purple underwear before, Calvin. Why, why do you keep calling me Calvin? Well, that is your name, isn't it? Calvin Klein? It's written all over your underwear. Ah. 
he invented that designer underwear market, which now is, is such a huge part of any major designer brand's business. It all originated with him. Klein's advertising campaigns continue to challenge consumers. In the 80s, he had Tom Hinton, the, the pole vaulter, wearing the first set of Calvin Klein's men's underwear and put that on an enormous billboard. When that emerged in 1982, it caused an absolute uproar. Like, people couldn't believe that men were being depicted in this way because, obviously, the idea of, of sexuality selling something had traditionally been this kind of female domain. By 1984, Klein was selling many different countries, obviously United States, and throughout the United States, 12,000 shops alone were selling his products. And then the rest of the world, Canada, for example, the UK, Ireland, were all selling products of Calvin Klein. The very interesting thing is that Calvin Klein sort of, by that point, represented a, a kind of American style. And that was obviously attractive to be exported. Um, it's really, it is really summed up in blue jeans. It's that idea of kind of a sexiness, an athleticism, a healthiness, um, and a, obviously a simplicity, a sort of pragmatism. In 1986, Calvin Klein married Kelly Rector in Rome, who was his assistant. And she had a great effect on his uh, business. Well, Kelly Rector first of all worked for Ralph Lauren, and then she went over to work for Calvin Klein, and he noticed her while she was assisting him. Um, they fell in love. They really stepped into the spotlight together and they became known as this idealised American couple. And so she became very much part of the brand, uh, wearing his clothes and selling his ideals. In the 1980s, Calvin Klein diversified his brand further into perfumes. Calvin Klein tried to launch perfume in the 1970s and it failed miserably. Um, but then in the 1980s, he relaunched. First of all, he launched Obsession in the early 80s. Um, and then he launched Eternity. And it's interesting to think of those as kind of symbolizing Calvin Klein's personal shift in his life. Um, Obsession was launched at a time when he was partying very hard, when he'd split from his first wife, Jane Center. Whereas Eternity came later and was after his, his marriage to Kelly Rector, this whole idea of a different kind of set of values, this whole idea of, of a focus on family. Both of them were incredibly um, well-selling perfumes and they continued to spin out and are uh, on sale even today. So in the early 90s, Calvin Klein um, kind of reappropriated some of that sort of bad boy ethos by featuring Kate Moss in the Obsession adverts. Again, through his advertising might, here he shoots a very, very young Kate Moss for the campaign for Obsession. And this causes quite a lot of outrage. It was an incredibly provocative advertising campaign for the way she looked, the way she spoke. Obsession. As with many of, of Calvin Klein's advertising campaigns, that aroused a, a great deal of, of disquiet, both from the public and from the industry. Um, that campaign generated a huge amount of, of attention. Calvin Klein continued to expand his collections and release groundbreaking print and television adverts. So Black Label Calvin Klein is very, very luxury. Um, and the offerings are coats, dresses, shoes, bags. And I think this move into the luxury market really symboled a kind of differentiation between the brands that the, the, the brand identity and the different strands that he had on offer. CK was yet again another line that was added in the 90s and I think this kind of more affordable accessible uh, line really meant that his market could be widened ever still there's a lasting legacy um, of the CK logo on t-shirts jumpers these kind of easy to wear sportswear uh, crossing into fashion items using Marky Mark in his advertising campaigns uh, really showed a, yet again how he could really feel the times and use a personality to advertise to people. Marky Mark was at this time pop star, uh, Mark Wahlberg, and now known as an, a, a big Hollywood actor. Really in the 1990s, um, 
that was Calvin Klein at one of his the, one of the best points, one of his most influential moments was in the 1990s. Not just in terms of the the mass appeal of Calvin Klein underwear being promoted by people like Marky Mark, but also in terms of um, the impact that his catwalk shows was having. You know, Calvin Klein was really at the forefront of minimalism. That was the 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 most influential um, movement in 1990s fashion. Philip Van Heusen bought Calvin Klein in 2002. They paid 430 million along with another 200 to 300 million in, in stock options. This had some interesting ramifications for the company Klein himself. In 2003 and, and, and two, when the negotiations were happening, he was written in for 15 years as creative director. However, in 2003, he began to take a slight step back. You know, Calvin Klein was older. Calvin Klein, you know, wanted to sell, wanted to settle down, wanted to step back from the the day-to-day -day operation of the company. The fact that he was retained as a consultant was interesting. You know, the fact that he still obviously wanted to um, wanted to be involved in the company, and he consulted on the Euphoria fragrance for them. Calvin Klein have really as a business been very interested in new technologies and they have used live streaming but a really innovative approach was using uh, their QR scanning codes and I think there's a real interest from them from a business perspective to really communicate and keep in contact with their buyers. At the moment it's, it's an odd moment for Calvin Klein because the head of women's wear and the head of men's wear have just left Calvin Klein. The head of men's wear is, was Italo Zucchelli and the head of women's wear was Francisco Costa. Um, and they've both been there since Calvin Klein exited the business in 2003. I think the interesting thing now is to see who's going to be brought in. The, the discussions around Calvin Klein are that they want to unite all the brands under a single creative director, um, the way that it used to be under, under Calvin Klein himself. It will be very interesting to see if they can unite such an enormous company and such a diverse group of lines under a single creative direction. I think Calvin Klein's legacy is one of a very clever way of creating brands. You really understand that he had this real view of building a department store brand, so to speak. It's really interesting to look at his marketing and the way in which he's kept with the zeitgeist without letting the clothes sort of be led by kind of trend-based movements. The other thing that Calvin Klein really did was to export a particular idea of, of Americanness. When we look at Calvin Klein clothes, when we look at the images that Calvin Klein created around them, the images that he, you know, those kind of seminal images, they're really emblematic of a, a, a certain type of American life. It's about athleticism, it's about health, it's about a certain type of beauty. And I think that's a massive legacy for anyone to have, this way of, of changing the way that we look at the world, not just the way that we look at fashion.